Yeah, let's get it. Let's get it twisted. Let's get it twisted. Here, here's first. Let's start with some fun news, okay? The goats linked up and they were building, okay? They were linked up and they were fucking building. Look how happy they are. Look how fucking happy yeah, they are. You love to see it. You love to see smiles on faces, okay? This is the era of smiles. Yeah. Are they wearing seat? No, dude. They're fuck. And Kim Jong Un, of course, they're not wearing seat belts. He's also driving in the middle of the road, bro. They do what the fuck they want. Okay. I don't know what this is. I don't know if it's because like we just rarely ever get stuff from DPRK, but I'm going to be I'm going to be radically honest here and tell you that I don't know why when I see like western leaders do shit like this, it doesn't hit the same. It's got to be because like we never see these dudes in general. It's like a weird collab, you know what I mean? It's like, "Whoa, I didn't expect that." You know how like sometimes I'll do like a collab with a TikToker and then in the in the comments people will be like, "Oh my god, my worlds are colliding." That's what it feels like. <laughs> when you see this, you're like, "What the fuck happened?" Like this is so strange. However, when you see Joe Biden doing stuff like this with like Western leaders, it doesn't hit the same. And I don't know why. Did you see this? Wait, what? Video Putin and Kim Jong-un on who enters the car first. Oh my God. Please, please send me more, more videos of this collab. I need to see more of this. But like, come on, come on, come on. You get him first. Putin and Kim saying goodbye very soon. It's not goodbye though. It's see you later. You know, it's not goodbye. It's like, we'll help you build up your nuclear arsenal. It's more like, we'll help you build up your nuclear arsenal, which is the only way that you can have autonomy outside of like the American sphere of influence. Um, and, and you'll give us like every piece of artillery that you would have used to, uh, you know, bomb South Korea instead. Like, it's kind of like that. It's a mutually beneficial relationship for everybody is sharing is caring. Like if you hate on this, you hate friendship. You know what I mean? Like, if you hate on, if you hate on two guys, just, you know, masters of their craft, doing what they do best, right? Having a great fucking time. You just basically hate friendship. You hate friendship and you hate diplomacy and you hate, you hate appreciating craftsmen. I hate this because they excluded the goat G. Well, that was probably deliberate. Because the GOAT G is way more like kick back and watch America fuck itself up in comparison to Putin, who is very much like, no, I actively will do uh, horrible things, like unimaginably uh, awful things, um, especially because I recognize that like America's influence on the global stage is waning. This is my favorite Kim eggs Vladi Poo clip. No way. Putin no fucking wet bro what wait where did it go i i lost it oh here it is no way dude nah this is a meme right wait they didn't even drink it nah they reversed it they reversed it No, that would never happen, bro. Come on, are you kidding me? Vladimir Putin being feeded with wild adulation in North Korea and a parade in his honor. Oh, yeah. That's got to be sick as hell. Like, that definitely is, like, probably the coolest aspect of North Korea in general is, like, they just fucking do crazy parades out there, you know? They're like, oh, hell yeah. Like, we got, we got a white boy up in here. We got a white boy up in this bitch. Fucking parade time, you know? Like, they do that for Dennis Rodman, too. Like, I get why Dennis Rodman loves North Korea. Am I, am I the only one that hates parades? I don't really like parades that much, either. I just think, like, this kind of parade is cool. Yo! That's sick. They're playing, like, the old hits. You heard that, and you said that that's the marriage song? 
Yeah, the marriage of fucking dialectics and materialism. What the fuck? Yeah, dude. That's the... Korea loves to parade the little bros. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They have, like, excellent command over the children. It's pretty crazy. So do the Chinese, though. It's wild. The Have you guys ever seen, like, the little Chinese babies balling up? Like, they're crazy. Or, like, cooking and shit. I don't know what the hell's going on out there, but they're just, like, they got excellent command over the children. Uh, it's it's crazy. They'll be, they'll be jump roping and shit in, like, and, and they're doing it, like, in sequence. Like, this stuff is wild, dude. I mean, look, ultimately, it doesn't really matter. Obviously, like, the, the fucking military with, like, superior firepower with, like, you know, a drone operator could light these boys up no matter how well they parade. But, like, this is, the cool, this is one of the cooler aspects of the military. I think the engineering core, if you were to build, like, indestructible bridges rather than, like, bridges that you can specifically roll tanks over... If that if that's all the military did, like parades like this, and then like building shit, then the military would be sick. I'd be one hundred percent on board. Like the engineering and and then the parades. It's awesome. It's a jobs program anyway. I'm fine with it. As long as you're just like building shit, you know? Meanwhile, what does our military do? They just they kill. They don't do the fucking cool ass parades. There's nobody marches like this. Okay, the only time we build shit is when we want to like defend Israel's genocide and be like, yeah, look, we built a pier and then it, keep, it keeps getting swept away. It sucks, bro. It's lame as hell, dude. Trump wanted the military march like this. Think of what we lost. I know. Well, the problem with the with the military marches like this is that we don't have any like infrastructure that's sustainable. So. If you were to like roll tanks through those fucking roads, it would destroy the roads completely. So that's a big problem. I'm not even joking. Like that's, uh, that was legitimately the reason why we couldn't do it. I don't know. I just don't think like the Super Bowl flowers hit the same way as like seeing like Chinese kindergarten. Yeah, this shit's crazy, bro. I don't know what the hell's going on out there. I don't know what they're putting in the water. I don't know how they have like. I don't know how they're getting these little chicken nuggets to fucking do all of this. Like, they're cute as hell. I love these videos, but it is crazy. It's just abuse, bro. Why do you see, why do you see children, like, doing aerobics exercise and you go, it must be abuse. That's crazy. They're just, they're playing, bro. I don't think it's abuse. Like, that's insane. Bro, learning how to fucking do the wraparound technique to, like, get leverage when you're going up a rope is crazy work when you're six years old. Like, that is... Like, there is no fucking way I could have done that. My six-year-old ass could never, okay? I was fat as fuck. There was no way that shit was happening. I would not be making it out of the Chinese kindergarten, okay? This part is incredible. Bro, they have excellent ball handling. Like, how? Chinese kindergarten. Like, how? How? These kids ball handle better than you, okay? Straight up. This is propaganda and it's working on me. This is China propaganda on the Chinese app. No, I 100% sure. But it's, like, fair. Not gonna lie, it just looks like they have properly resourced schools. They force these kids to do this. Otherwise, they have to watch the ad at the top of the hour at school. Fuck! No one knows the training Kyrie went through. Yeah. This and the and the wrap the plastic bag around the basketball training. God damn it. You cooked my ass, bro. Fuck you. I'm sending you to, to Chinese kindergarten. Your disrespect has landed you in Chinese kindergarten. Okay? Fuck you. Except you'll probably come back more powerful than ever. Chinese citizen here. Back in elementary school, we totally had jump rope contests across school every year. Uh... Bro, this isn't propaganda law. This is legit what I did in elementary school. I swear to you, I was the slowest kid in my class. And when I came to the U.S., I was the second fastest in my grade, Lamau. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, it's Chinese propaganda, okay? It's propaganda. As in, I, I want this. I want it. I want this to happen in America. And I want this to... to <laughs> I want China to take over, man. This, oh, this part is crazy. Dude, Americans see kids working out and immediately go, that's right, brother. They're doing it at gunpoint. They, if they don't, 
the American understanding of China is so awesome because they look at look at children doing like a drill, right? And immediately go, they must be doing it because otherwise they can't get their daily ration of food. Okay? Thinking like thinking it's like North Korea in the fucking during the famine era. You know, just like that other Chinese country. What do they call it? The Democratic People's China? Democratic People's Republic of China? All Chinese to me. <laughs> Is there school lunch debt in China? <laughs> Somehow I doubt it. I bet these little children don't know how to fucking duck under a goddamn table when there's a school shooting happening, though. That's right. That's right. How many of those little babies are traumatized by a potential school shooting? That's right. None of them. We make our boys and girls strong out here by shooting them in the fucking head. If you survive, you're better off. Like, these drills are... I mean, these drills are pretty fucking good for that age. Like, at the park I go to, there's always, like, children uh, with, like, a basketball coach. And none of, none of the American kids uh, that are even older than these kids can, can have this level of ball control. Many adults don't have this level of ball control. <laughs> Dozens more did the swinging. That's like one hundreds more, not dozens more. Yeah, I mean, we used to do that shit too. Look. A California high school has the well-nigh perfect answer to the president's call for physical fitness. Stan Laprati, physical education director at La Sierra High School, has developed a program that assures every student of physical excellence. Exercise on the grip swing puts muscles on the least athletic. Bench and push-ups are among the toughest of the drills. As an incentive to excel, the color of the shorts the boys wear is determined by their ratings on performance charts. Some requirements for top ratings are stricter than for an apple. This was for the draft. It's 1962. I don't know what the fuck they were doing it for, but let me tell you something, okay? Uh, high school China having elementary school train. No, like this was this was a public this was a a, a publicly funded project though, wasn't it? Alice, please. A lad who has mastered the pegboard will find a military obstacle course a snap. 200 schools across the country have adopted La Sierra. I can't do that. There is no way I could do that. That's cool as hell. There is program of 15 minute daily competitive exercise. That's gay as hell, bro. On a hot day, they wet down the wrestling mats for sliding. The boys at La Sierra are learning that it's not only good sense to get toughened up, it's fun. Yeah, JFK implemented it. Is this the shape of things to come? It can be with modern conveniences and push buttons. Easy living is sapping the strength and vitality of our children. One third of them of school age can't pass minimum physical achievement test. Urge your school to offer at least 15 minutes of daily vigorous activity. This can bring our nation's youth up to sound physical standards. For a free booklet to help you evaluate the youth fitness program of your school, just write President's Council on Physical Fitness, Washington 25, D.C. China has a school stabbing problem. <laughs> China knife attack counterterror drill demonstration at Chinese lower school. What's he saying? <laughs> Dude, man catchers are so funny. Wait, where is his where is his like nuclear arsenal? I don't understand. Why does this cop have a man catcher, dude? I don't get it. Why isn't he? Why hasn't he busted at the blicky? Why isn't he fucking 360 no scoping him? I don't understand. Where is the Glock? Where is the officer issued? Where's the police? Where is his service weapon? Damn, he, wait, he committed suicide in front of the children? That's, that's metal as hell, bro. That's crazy. What the fuck? Wait, you'll never catch me alive. Yeah, bro, fucking calm down, dude. Uh, it's well known that in China, the sniper in a skyscraper 1K away from where the attacker is. This is what defunded police look like. Yeah, well, I mean, technically he did chop up a couple of the children. Let's be real. Bro, they're teaching the kids to love the attacker. 
That's crazy. He's like, hello, what's up, everybody? I am the, uh, I'm the knife stabber. And, uh, yeah, look at this pretty sweet trick I got going. How do we get here? Oh, uh, Pootie Poo and Kim also bonded over dogs, horses, and driving. Kim Jong-un gives Putin a pair of dogs on a trip to Pyongyang. <laughs> Why do these dogs look like busted-ass Shiba Inus? The two bonded over animals with Putin watching as Kim fed carrots to a horse. Jindos, fuck you. They're called the Jindo. Oh, nice. Chinese Johnny Harris. What is this? AI. Our TikTok account was banned. Over 340,000 followers vanished into thin air. We've dug deeper and discovered it's more than just a ban. It's a U.S. Philippine government joint campaign to silence journalists. Firstly, the U.S. and Philippine government identify their targets through NGOs and other white gloves. Secondly, the Philippine media begin to churn out articles which not only attack specific social media accounts, but also rally trolls to report these accounts. Finally, social media platforms end up banning these accounts to respond to the surge of reports. What we've uncovered is a complex web of U.S. and Philippine operations designed to control the narrative and influence public perception of the South China Sea. Enhanced videos on TikTok. I'm going to visit CNN's Beijing bureau and let them give my answer. Most definitely. Wait. I don't get it. How the fuck? Wait. Why are they? I thought it was the China app. What's going on? Dude, Bite Dance, you're failing me. You're failing me. I'm honestly surprised we didn't see a shirtless couple at horse he ride for Vladdy Poo and Unny Baby. No. Um, Unk. Uncle. Uncle Un. Uncle Un. He's not. He's not ever getting on a horse. Let's be real. I don't think he's ever. Has, has Kim Jong Un ridden a horse? Has he rode a horse before? He probably has, right? He wouldn't do a shirtless, though. He wouldn't do a shirtless. Shirtless. He's a little too chubby. Yeah, we already. We already watched the cute moment between them. CIA has had a presence in Manila since its establishment after World War II. The Philippine government and the CIA are tight. Oh, yeah. Yes, he rides the Cholima. No. It's not him. It's his family who has written the Cholima. I think it was Kim Il-sung who wrote the Cholima. China unlocks YouTube channel. What do they do? We start this YouTube channel because we believe China's story is different. It does not mean China is to be feared, hated, or misunderstood. China is a country with thousands of years of history and its own political, economic, social, cultural traditions. It's easy to see China only through the West propagated lens, like authoritarian lack of freedom, but the perspective is profoundly limited bias and does not help build a peaceful world where the West-China relations is playing an increasingly important role. Australian scholar debunks Western lies on Xinjiang. Okay. How the West uses COVID and Ukraine crisis to blame China? That's kind of shocking. I guess the weight, the weight of it makes it so that he doesn't really fucking move at all uh, during the Gallup process. I take it back. I take it back. My, my bad. My bad. I apologize for the disrespect. I was unfamiliar with your game, sir. I apologize. My bad, bro. My bad, big bro. My bad. Dude, I love DPRK Media. They are so passionate. I have no idea what the fuck this lady is saying. I just know she's she's putting her whole she's putting her whole chest into it, okay? She's she's giving it everything she's got, okay? Oh, he's got swag though this shit is drippy like that jacket is fire i need it why does he look like he's pissing yo he just whipped the presidential dick out he's just <laughs> He's just ripping it, dude. Oh, 
울지 않던 빨지 산들의 강이한 그 정신 억천만 그 모닥불이 민족 재생의 불길로 타올랐고 장군님 뒤로 서겠습니다. 여기가 바로 저성영령의 사령. Let's see Biden do this. Let's see Trump do it. That'd be funnier. I think between Biden and Trump, like Trump is probably closer to like doing this kind of demonstration than Biden because he loves this shit a lot. But he's also significantly in like significantly worse shape than Brandon. But I would love to see it. I would love to see both of them for different reasons. Is the propaganda working or does he seem kind of endearing actually? I mean, he's just, just the dude, bro. On a horse. There's nothing funnier than like Americans being like, dude, that's the leader of DPRK. That's the leader of North Korea. He's like a gruesome dictator, which is true. Like, obviously, their their governing structure is pretty fucking brutal overall. But like, these motherfuckers can't do shit in comparison to the numbers on the board that American shit puts up on a daily basis. Like, they just don't have the weapons. They don't have the influence. They don't have the dominance. Sure, he'll dominate his own people, but like, think about, think about like every human life being the same, right? Every human life is, is worthy. Like how many fucking kills does he have in comparison to like any American president? Like he could, he could kill everyone in fucking North Korea tomorrow and then Force the people that were the executioners to kill themselves, and it would barely, it would barely fucking scratch the surface of like one uh, four-year uh, presidency in terms of like people killed. Wrong question. How many would he have with U.S. weapons? But like, no, that's not the wrong question. That's that's a hypothetical that just simply does not exist on this planet. And in the hypothetical, you're just like. This is the same principle behind, like, Hamas, if they had Israel's weapons, like, think about what they would do to Israel. It's like, yeah, bro, there would be no fucking apartheid if Hamas had the same level of weapons as Israel, okay? That's the point. There would be no Hamas if they had that level of... They would have sovereignty. They would have a standing military. There would be no... There would be no conflict to begin with. There would be no Hamas to begin with. Same goes for North Korea as well. Like... If North Korea had America-style weapons, they would not be North Korea. They would just be Korea, okay? And who knows how they would fucking operate? Who knows how they would be? Like, that's a fool's take? I don't think that's a fool's take at all. I think everybody always assumes that, like, our enemies would be just as ruthless and just as violent as us, like, in perpetuity. And maybe they would. Maybe. You know? Maybe they would. Noah San, you, sir, are a fool with a fool's take. <clears throat> Bro, you need to chill with that take, man. Hold up. Either way, it's not falsifiable. Exactly. Exactly. And a lot of people, and a, a, a lot of people refuse to acknowledge that. A lot of people refuse to acknowledge that and just go, no, you don't understand. Like, they would be just as bad, if not so much worse. Like, yeah, if they were just like America, then they would be bad. They would be significantly worse as far as, like, what they're doing now. But history, history is riddled. You chose Jubilee over Kendrick yesterday, nerd. No, man, you think I didn't want to watch the fucking Kendrick Lamar show? No, Twitch told us we were not allowed to restream it. Which was such a dumb decision by Twitch, by the way, and such a dumb decision by Amazon because everybody fucking restreamed it, just not on Twitch. You think I wouldn't? You you think I didn't want to fucking watch it? I asked, and I don't even think they enforced it anyway because DJ Academics restreamed it on Twitch. I think I'm Dante re restreamed it too. Like there was a hell of Twitch streamers that were restreaming it too. I know, bro. I know the difference is I foolishly asked, and they said don't even fucking think about it. Why do you think Kai was not streaming it? Why do you personally think Kai Sinat, the largest content creator on this platform, was not live while that was happening? Do you think he would have... Do you think he doesn't like it? Do you think that he just didn't want to do it? No, the reason why he didn't uh, do it is specifically because Twitch literally said to him and to me and to anyone that I guess... Uh, 
is at the top of the directory that uh, is at the top of the directory that that wanted to restream it that they could not do it. Anyway. <laughs> Got friends who don't think who think the president isn't responsible for the deaths in Palestine. The every American president has more bodies in DPRK of China, Russia take doesn't fly. Wait, what do you mean it doesn't fly? It doesn't matter if they whether they consider it to be correct or not doesn't change the reality. Like every president that has continued to implement a global sanctions regime on countries that are outside of the outside of the sphere of influence of the United States of America is responsible for the deaths that accompany such severe crippling sanctions in said nations. Like those, those deaths are on, uh, the, on every American politician right off the bat. That's where the big numbers are too. Um, having said that though, like I say, he's not fucking, he's not like a good dude. This is still a monarchy functionally, a theocratic monarchy functionally, you know? Um, not exactly great. I also forgot to run the top of the hour ad break after that chatter fucked me up. So I'm running it now. What's the religion? Some made up shit. Not like officially a religion, but it's more like, it's kind of like a religion. A theocratic monarchy, really? Come on, bro. Like, oh no, the people just love, the people just happen to love this dynasty. And that's why they keep voting for it. Here's a quick breakdown, TikTok breakdown on the Korean War. Yeah, I'm here. Because there's a man mad in my comments saying, I don't understand Korean history because according to him, there's no connection between the Japanese colonization of Korea and the pro-democracy student protests that followed for decades after. The Japanese colonization of Korea ended in 1945 after 35 years because they lost in World War II. And afterwards, Korea didn't really have a central government of their own. And the U.S. and USSR came in and divided the peninsula at the 38th parallel. This was supposed to be temporary, but we know what happened there. Mind you, this is a line drawn by these external countries. Remember when, yesterday when you said you needed to tighten your stream because you can't get all the news you want to? Yeah, but like, this is fun. I'm having fun. And also, secondly, there's not a lot of fucking major news stories today anyway. So, this is a major news story. Friendship day between fucking North Korea and Russia? Major news. Wait, wait, wait without consulting the Koreans. Also unsurprisingly, instead of letting the Koreans hold their own elections and choose their own unified government, the US instead propped up a right-wing authoritarian regime with Lee seung -man at its helm, aka a US puppet. Why? Because at this time, majority of Koreans supported socialism, which obviously didn't fit the mold for the US wants to spread capitalism globally. Obviously, the public backlash was immense as it- Protests in Kenya today with kids leading the charge, Hasanabi silence, why? Yeah, famously, um, famously, I just have a, I have a secret position on it. That's why I do not eat poop. Pretty much solidified the division of the country into two. And there are protests all across the South with the most significant in Jeju Island, now known as Jeju Uprising. Up to 30,000 Jeju Islanders were killed, which was 10% of the entire population by the US-backed South Korean government and also the US military itself. To give a little perspective of how the government was, it was literally illegal for South Koreans to even mention the Jeju uprising, um, and it was punishable by torture if they did. Shortly after, the Korean War broke out, which was, if you think about it, partly caused by the actions of the U.S., which is ironic because for the longest time growing up, I thought that the United States were some type of heroes coming in to save the poor South Koreans, because that's how they wrote about it in our textbooks. Like, they really portrayed MacArthur as this courageous, intelligent, <laughs> empathetic war general. And definitely not, like, an insane racist who wanted to fucking nuke every Asian country and specifically kept begging for it over and over again. Well, but he killed 20% of the North Korean population. Um, he wanted to use nuclear weapons against them. And even yeah. when ceasefire discussions were happening, he He's kept like, wanting please, bro, please, like, let me get one fucking nuke off. Let me, let me get one off, bro. Let me get one off. We did it to the, we did it to the Japans. Please, bro. China. Let me nuke China. Let me nuke, let me nuke Korea. Come on, bro. Let me nuke one of these motherfucking, let me nuke one of these motherfucking countries. Please, please. As a treat, as a treat, as a treat. Come on. They're all Chinese anyway. Okay. They're all Japanese at that time. I guess they, Japan was, uh, no, at that point, it's just like, at this point, they're, they're now officially like anyone who's a communist is my major enemy.
So he's like, please, please, please. They're all Chinese. <laughs> They're all different Chinese variants. Let me kill them. <laughs> to bomb them instead. Um, and the U.S. literally had to remove him. I know he was also the one that recommended Shiro Ishii and other members of Unit 731 be granted immunity in exchange for data. If that does anything. By the way, the data that she's speaking of was specifically utilized. Is talking about uh, chemical weapons. Uh, chemical weapons that were used in Korea. That is the reason why they were granted immunity in exchange for data. Data being bioweapons. Those chemical, those biological weapons were used in Korea. 731 be granted immunity in exchange for data. If that does anything. Okay, and then after the Korean War ended, the right-wing authoritarian regime was still standing strong, and Lee Seung Man won his fourth term as president, and his pick for VP also won following a most likely rigged election. This led to large student protests called the April Revolution, where up to 200 students were killed. Following Lee Seung Man, majority of the Korean presidents that followed after were also military dictators because once that system is set in place, it's hard to change. Park chung seized power with a military coup in 1961 where he served as a military dictator for almost- Why is in China pressure North Korea to increase the standard of living? North Korea has increased the standard of living. People think North Korean standard of living is like assembling the 90s when there was massive famine and like they lost their most significant partner, the USSR. But North Korean standards of living- North Korean standards of living even in the immediate aftermath of the Korean War, which uh, literally was genocide, was significantly better than South Korean standards of living. South Korea kind of lapped North Korea and even Japan, I would say, since they changed their military dictatorship structure into the, the Shayball structure that you know, that you know South Korea as, and they blew the fuck up. They have like, I mean, obviously they have like massive companies uh, and, and uh, very successful industries, very successful industries in the, in the in the arts field as well um but that wasn't how it that wasn't what it was like at all for the longest time for the longest time north korea was was doing pretty good and then obviously 90s mass famine no allies sanctions regime dprk is cooked at that point since then they've been able to since then they've definitely been able to uplift uh, the material conditions of all North Koreans, but like it's still not great. But um, they are they're definitely they're definitely doing better than the 90s. At the time of the Vietnam War, Saigon had a higher standard of living than South Korea, but military countries were recruited to fight in Vietnam. That's why their GDP blew up. Seized power with a coup d'état of December 12th in 1979, which I highly recommend this movie. It's literally crazy bonkers. Um, it talks about how it happened. And he also led the coup d'état of May 17th in 1980, where he declared martial law across the entire country. So universities were shut down, any type of political activity banned. Um, he controlled the press, which led to more student protests, especially the Kwangju massacre, where up to 2,300 people were killed. Also, I forgot to mention this, but the South Korean military was under U.S. command at the time, and it was the Carter administration that gave the green light to Chun Duan to take over Gwangju with military force. AKA, history is all connected, and it's all a trickle-down effect from one incident to the next. And to the man who called me dumb and said I was stupid for saying the impacts of colonialism ultimately led to pro-democracy protests, I hope this helps. That was great. Um... North Korea, like most nations, had rival factions between reformers and hardliners, army and intelligence, and so on. There's so much liberal propaganda from the Anglosphere that people even in this chat fail to think critically. I did not watch the Burning Sun K-pop scandal. Anyway, let's move away from best Korea, popular Korea, and let's get to Israel, Palestine. Another place where our impact can be felt. Because even if you don't care for American politics, American politics cares for you. Elden Ring DLC when? Great question. It's not even fucking out yet. What do you want me to do? Okay. The Elden Ring DLC is coming out on PC uh, in a couple hours. I unfortunately did not play Elden Ring on the PC. I played it on the PlayStation. So I don't believe I'll be able to play it uh, until later tonight. Uh, I think the PC one comes out in like two hours. The PS5 Elden Ring comes out. Yeah, that's a big L, I know. Call Miyazaki, let me hold, hold up, let me call him up. L for me overall, okay.
The Western Anglo propaganda about DPRK is so effective that even leftists who wouldn't trust the U.S. government on anything else believe them on this. Yeah, I mean, I'm not of the I'm not of the mindset that like uh, North Korea is fucking awesome and it's a cheery paradise where they're eating hamburger every day. Uh, having said that, however, I do recognize why North Korea is the way it is. North Korea is the way it is because of us, for sure. Like, 100%. Um, random, but did Austin ever call back? I'm worried. No. All right, let's get to, let's get to another, another part of the world where, like I said, our impact can be felt. And then I'll talk about the Kendrick Lamar concert after, uh, after the, the Israel stuff. Washington now and serious tensions between Israel and the Biden administration in the wake of a very public accusation by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang, has more. Good morning, Selena. Hey, good morning, Rebecca. Sources here at the White House tell me they're angry and frustrated with Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu. This latest fallout started after Netanyahu released a Secretary video this week Jesus. accusing the U.S. of withholding yeah, okay. weapons from Israel. But the White House says that's not true, that military aid continues to flow to Israel except for one shipment of 2,000-pound bombs. Now, the administration officials, they say that what Netanyahu did is beyond the pale. In response, they canceled a high-level meeting with Israel focused on security and the threat from Iran. But still, several top Israeli officials are coming to Washington today. They're meeting with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan at the White House for more informal meetings. But, Rebecca, it is clear that this administration's patience with Netanyahu is running very thin. Despite that, Netanyahu is still planning to come to Washington next month and give a speech in front of Congress. So, Selena, the meetings will happen, very likely, but how is this going to impact the situation on the ground? Yeah, Rebecca, well, look, it is not helpful for Israel to show that it has tensions with its main ally, especially at a time when it's facing these increasing threats from Hezbollah. This administration is deeply concerned about escalations between Israel and Lebanon. In fact, the White House even sent a top aide to the region to try and prevent this from turning into an all-out war. Rebecca? All right, Selena Wang. Thank you, Selena. Turning now to the conflict. Anyway, um, Nenya was buying every ticket for the scapegoat ravel. He might win the prize soon. So... Uh, Daniel Hagari popped off yesterday, my fucking Dumbo ass King. Uh, we covered it obviously as soon as it happened, just like we covered the Hezbollah stuff as soon as it was happening, but it's uh, good to, to go back to it a little bit. No, I'm not going to react to burning sun, exposing the secret K-pop chat groups, BBC world series documentaries. Please stop asking me that I need to watch this. Okay. I'm not going to watch that right now. Like, please. I, I, Please be serious. What is happening? Why is chat like this? I like how everyone slash libs are always like, oh, we need to find a way to prevent all of our war in the region. Like Israel is in a rabid dog that does whatever it wants. So, um, yeah, two things happened. Uh, two things that are like very important, very pressing matters in, uh, in Israel right now. One, Daniel Hagari came out and was like, we can't defeat Hamas. We can't destroy Hamas. Like, what are you talking about? That's a political issue. He then, of course, went back on it because Netanyahu yelled about it. Simultaneously, though, the Israeli war cabinet uh, or the Israeli generals got together and were like, let's get ready to go invade Lebanon. This is what's going on in Israel. If you want updates on what's going on in Israel, th there's a little bit of drama. The girls are fighting, okay? The girls are fighting in the Middle East and the Israeli army's chief spokesperson is casting doubt on Israel's goal to destroy Hamas. In an interview with Israeli television, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari said, quote, whoever thinks we can eliminate Hamas is wrong. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office responded, reiterating that the Israeli military is committed to achieving its goals in Gaza. And a spokesperson from the Israeli Defense Forces issued a statement saying that Hagari's comments we're referring to the destruction of Hamas as an ideology and an idea. Meanwhile, the U.S. military's floating aid pier is expected to resume operations today after it was temporarily removed due to bad conditions at sea. That's according to Reuters. And this all comes as tensions appear to be on the brink between Israel and Hezbollah. The leader of Lebanon's militant group warned Israel that it has new weapons and intelligence capabilities that could hit deeper inside Israel in the case of an all-out war. Our Chris Livesay is following all of these developments for us from Tel Aviv.
Chris, good morning. Hey, Anne-Marie, good morning to you. The Israeli military spokesman indeed says Israel can't defeat Hamas in Gaza without installing a new government there. Speaking to Israeli TV, Daniel Hagari said, quote, the idea that it's possible to destroy Hamas to make Hamas vanish, that is throwing sand in the eyes of the public. If we do not bring something else to Gaza, at the end of the day, we will get Hamas. It was a rare break, publicly at least, between the military and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who has vowed absolute victory over Hamas since the October 7 attacks. Now, earlier this week, Netanyahu dissolved his war cabinet after Benny Gantz, his moderate rival, left the group over the Prime Minister's failure to produce a day-after plan for Gaza. Meanwhile, focus in Israel's... Read between the lines, they want to achieve their goals in Gaza, and the eradication of an ideal is impossible, but political and social W... For Israel is just to eradicate and cleanse the area. No, he is he is saying this because the generals are of a different mindset. The military in Israel is oftentimes even more fucking violent in the way that they conduct their affairs and what they advocate for than the civilian politicians that don't have military experience. That obviously changes when we're talking about settler politicians. Settler politicians are infinitely more violent than everybody else. But in between, in between Bibi and like Benny Gantz, for example, while Benny Gantz is seen as a more moderate force in the war cabinet or was in the war cabinet, he's no longer in the war cabinet, he resigned, as you guys know. Benny Gantz being like a general style politician, times be way more violent in the way that he wants to conduct military affairs. However, there is, um, there is the, the, the continuation of the apartheid. When we get to the continuation of the apartheid, Benjamin Netanyahu seemingly becomes more right-wing than the likes of um, uh, uh, Benny Gantz. They both still want the apartheid to continue, but they, are, they do not have the same opinions on what must be done in Gaza, what can be done in Gaza. It's a really, I, I think it's a really interesting dynamic. Obviously, everyone doesn't care about, uh, everyone is united when it comes to like, you know, hurting the Palestinians, killing as many Palestinians as possible while still maintaining some semblance of like uh, uh, Western support. But Benjamin Netanyahu has not really revealed what his plans are for Gaza. Itamar ben Givir wants to wipe out the entirety of the Gaza Strip. Smotrich wants to, like the settlers, the super, super far right, want to wipe out the entirety of the Gaza Strip and resettle. The generals who are like center right, still very fucking hardline on, um, you know, all the death and destruction in Gaza, have a more reasonable American State Department backed approach where they look at the situation critically and they go, We can't control this territory permanently. You know, you broadcast an image of Anthony Blinken with a red triangle painted on his face in your intro today. I didn't even notice that, but it's crazy that you were in here. You recognize that, and now you're doing a fucking... What is this? Why did you show Anthony Blinken with a red triangle painted? That's a funhouse bit. Are you, are, you, uh, are you another one of these, like... Are you another one of these fucking, like, cancel, cancel Hassan Andes? Like, what's going on? What's happening here? Ethan literally did that argument today multiple times. It was gross as fuck. You're mad at Ethan, but also simultaneously just coming in here to, to what? Uh, no, nah, not an October 7 lever. That's great, man. Following since October 7th, 2020. No, this is, this is, this could be one of two things, okay? Either he's like, you're inconsistent. Remember when you were talking about the red triangle? Remember when you were talking about the red triangle being like, uh, very obviously, uh, very obviously a, a, an issue, like a, like a call for death? Well, it seems like you're being inconsistent on this because you showed a video that you weren't even aware of where Anthony Blinken had a red triangle on him, okay? So it's either you should have never criticize people posting red triangles at all or or he's the type of dude who's just like you know I, he's just farming a clip for reddit i think we'll see it we'll see it on the fucking divorce subreddit in like 10 minutes i assume he's just like a a uh apolitical when it comes to uh reddit karma many such cases just pointing it out brother i'm a fan of yours yeah, he's just a noticer of things. Good Lord, you are so thin-skinned. Bro, we're literally fucking covering news, and you brought forward something from the intro that I wasn't even fucking aware of. Do you think that that is like a genuine concern, a cause for genuine concern, 
Or do you think that's someone trying to make a bigger deal out of something? Okay. Every four year fan, you are a bad person. I know. What is going on? Like, what the fuck's happening? I need to ban more people again. Like, I, I really do. I really do need to ban more fucking dumbasses again. None of this conversation is remotely fucking productive. It's just people going, me, 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 pay attention to me. I want to call you. I want to do a call out and then say that you're thin skinned. Do you think this is like good discourse? Do you think we're getting a good back, back and forth here? Seems to be shifting north where cross border clashes with Lebanon have been heating up in recent. No, I know the chatter was just annoyed that you criticized the protesters for painting the red triangle. If you read the rest of the chat, I know. Also, there's probably a little bit of a difference between like someone making a post and sneaking in a red, uh, red triangle on Anthony fucking Blinken versus like going to a random like uh, uh, a Jewish museum director's fucking house for the crime of like hosting uh, the the uh, Nova Festival, which was like definitely like a propaganda piece in general. And then like spray painting a red triangle. If you cannot make that distinction in your own mind, I don't know how to explain uh, things to you at all. Right. One is like. It's, it's akin to just like neutralizing or at least um, it's akin to looking at a situation where I have a gun in my hand going, come and take it, brother. And thinking that that's the same thing as like putting a gun to someone's head, like a real gun to someone's head. You know, one, it can be read as a death threat. The other is just a fucking meme. I hope that that is uh, self-explanatory for many of you, you know. Don't fucking do red triangles on people's houses. That's insane. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but if you just wanted to legit point out something possibly problematic, you just DM Hassan's mods. They could take a look at it in the background without making a whole ass publicly clippable thing. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's, it, it'll become a clippable thing anyway. You just gave, you just gave like discourse for eight fucking hours uh, for the worst dumbasses on the planet who in between their ferocious defense of Israel's ethnic cleansing will now do drama off of this as well. And then repackage the drama about how fucking thin-skinned I am. Days with Hezbollah. Yesterday, the leader of the Iran-backed militants warned, warned Israel that if a full-blown war breaks out, quote, there will be no place safe from our missiles and our drones. Here in Israel, there's a sense of not if, but when that day comes. Some 80,000 Israelis have been displaced by those clashes with Hezbollah. Israel's defense minister has said they should be able to go back home in time for the upcoming school year. Mm. Anne Marie. I know, Chris, this is the kind of rhetoric we hear from Hezbollah a lot, but you can't help but to be concerned when you consider how tense things are right now. Uh, Chris, thank you very much. Hassan Nasrallah saying no place in Israel would be safe in the event of all-out war. If war is imposed on Lebanon, the resistance will fight without restraints, without rules, and without limits. The enemy knows very well that we have prepared ourselves for the worst and most difficult days. And the enemy knows very well what awaits it. And that is why it was deterred for nine months. His televised speech focused on what he says is the group's expanded military and intelligence capabilities. Now, this followed Hezbollah's release of that purported drone video showing Israeli military and civilian sites in northern Israel. Israel responding that Hezbollah <sighs> would be destroyed in an all-out war. <clears throat> ben Wiedemann joining us uh, from Beirut. Nasrallah also had a pointed warning for the Republic of Cyprus. Ben saying it would be targeted if it allows Israeli forces to use its military bases or airports. Of course, Cyprus has held joint military drills with Israel several times over the past decade. What's going on here? Well, this um, reference to Cyprus really came out of the blue. You know, we monitored Hezbollah media channels very closely, and there was no hint uh, that... Here, let's, uh, before we continue with this, I, I just want to give an update. There's Akbar Shahid Ahmed from Huffington Post. The Biden administration uh, covering uh, the Economist Middle Eastern correspondent uh, Greg Carlson's take. The Biden administration doesn't want to be blamed if it fails to broker a deal between Israel and Hezbollah. But it can't broker a deal unless there's a lasting ceasefire in Gaza. Israel refuses a lasting ceasefire and Biden refuses to seriously pressure Israel to accept one. This is the problem. Instead of going in the correct direction towards a ceasefire and a negotiation with uh, Lebanon, with Hezbollah, and also uh, the long-lasting ceasefire, three-phase 
program that Joe Biden claimed that it was Israel's own deal with the understandable assurances that uh, Hamas said they would agree to as long as there is a timeline and assurances, which is which we're now in the, like what the third week of since Biden unveiled that Israeli proposal. And then they kept saying over and over again, Hamas doesn't want to agree to this when they literally said they would. Anyway, um, there was one party that wasn't agreeing to it. It was Israel. So I don't know what happened there, but uh, amid fears of war in Lebanon, I'm hearing little hope Biden will take the key step to prevent that, using all his leverage to end the war in Gaza. We could wake up tomorrow to a massive Israeli attack, 1,000 people dead, and nothing would change, a U.S. official told me this week. Another official called concern in D.C. about a broader war higher than ever, making it more vital for the U.S. to push Israel to see that as a mistake. Israel political leadership ignores it, and in fact seeks a broader war, official said, noting that desire is strong beyond Netanyahu. Note the subtext beyond current Netanyahu Biden squad, uh, current Netanyahu Biden squabbling. The focus for the admin is still showing overwhelming support for Israel. Some feel that helps push Israel, but little sign of that so far, and doubtful Israel believes U.S. backing is at real risk. Even 2,000-pound bombs and the shipments of 2,000-pound bombs may resume. They stopped that. Remember that one shipment of 2,000 pound bombs that they stopped that Israel demands that Netanyahu is chirping about this past week? The Biden administration has not stopped its bear hug strategy. I don't think that it is because the Biden administration is calculating this as a strategic allegiance. If we bear hug Netanyahu, if we constantly give him everything he wants, then he'll be more susceptible to our pressure. Okay? I don't. I don't know if it's a fucking tactical miscalculation. I think that's I think that's giving too much credit. I personally think Biden is just a psycho, okay? I think he is a he is a freak all the way through. And he is surrounded by a bunch of sycophantic freaks and is refusing to listen to reason. Every report that I read in terms of palace intrigue, in terms of what is going on inside of the fucking White House, spells trouble biden has shut himself off from naysayers this reality is demonstrated on not only the israel palestine conflict on the israeli ethnic cleansing campaign and biden refuses to stop it also it also is very revealing when you look at the political actions that biden is taking in terms of domestic politics, in terms of his re-election campaign. Anytime there is a news article that comes out, anytime there's a news article that talks about Biden's re-election campaign and what's going on, they keep saying, they keep saying, absolutely not, things are going great, and, um, and the naysayers are being pushed aside. It's on all fronts, okay? Here's an article from Alex Thompson. Top Dems, Biden has losing strategy. Biden's core inner circle hasn't lost faith in that approach. The product of Biden and his longtime aide, Mike Donilon. Senior Democrats, including some of President Biden's aides, are increasingly dubious about his theory for victory in November. Okay? I'm not just talking about Israel-Palestine now. I'm talking about the attitude reflected from the Biden White House on every issue. Like, this is the way that he is operating. This is the modus operandi of an old man, okay? <clears throat> He's dubious about his theory for victory in November, which relies on voter concerns about January 6th, political violence, democracy, and Trump's character. Biden's core inner circle hasn't lost faith in that approach, but that puts them on an island within much of the party about what will decide the election. As polls consistently have shown, Biden tied or even behind after a slight bump following Trump's criminal conviction. This is why I also laugh whenever Trump supporters uh, huff on that copium, like, oh, Trump's conviction actually helped them. It's like, no, it didn't, okay? You're fucking delusional. Like, you, if it did, you wouldn't be fucking saying they arrested our boy because they can't defeat him electorally, okay? You'd be celebrating it, which you weren't. Anyway, several polls have indicated voters are deeply concerned about democracy, but they are mostly worried about inflation and the economy. They've also shown Biden's support slipping among key Democratic voting groups. Blacks, Latinos, young adults, and union members, but the democracy message is resonating with older voters. Biden's former chief of staff, Ron Klain, who has known Donilon, 
for decades told Axios his view is in Mike, I trust. What they're saying, a Democratic strategist in touch with the campaign told Axios, it is unclear to many of us watching from the outside whether the president and his core team realize how dire the situation is right now and whether they even have a plan to fix it. That's scary. People close to the president told Axios they worry about raising concerns in meetings because Biden's group of longtime loyal aides can exile dissenters. Okay? Biden is pushing people out when they actually tell him that he is doing something wrong. Pair that up with his long-term commitment to Zionism as a project that extends far beyond his presidential, uh, his presidential cycle, his presidential tenure, goes all the way back to the fucking 70s, where he has like publicly said that he loves Israel, that he would create an Israel if Israel didn't exist, the fact that he has told Israel that he would kill, that they should kill more babies even, okay? Biden being a Zionist is good. Yeah, dude, yeah. It's better than you thinking that this is a good way to fucking debate me at the top of the hour to serve an ad break with a fucking sock account that you created, you know? Biden being a Zionist is good. Thinking that this is going to work to serve a three-minute ad break at the top of the hour is great. I got clapped with a single text bait, okay? Get back to that. Don't do this. Don't do this. It's not working. Get your funny up. Get your money up too. Anyway, here's the three minute ad break. Now, if you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe. Like I said, for $5 or for free with a Twitch prime by connecting your Amazon prime account to your Twitch account, you get one free prime subscription a month. Use it on your favorite broadcaster. Hopefully that's me. Here's the three minute ad break now. <clears throat> Even for those close to the center, there is hesitance to raise skepticism or doubt about the current path for fear of being viewed as disloyal. A person in Biden's orbit told Axios, speaking on condition of anonymity because of those dynamics, there is not a discussion that a change of course is needed. Donalon, Biden's top political aide, privately has reassured people that voters will do the right thing in November by embracing democracy and rejecting Trump, according to a Biden aide who has heard Donalon say it. Joe Biden is a great president and great presidents get reelected is another common Donalon refrain. Donald Trump, one of the most experienced and understated Democratic operatives in the country, has worked with Biden since 1981. Do you know how many fucking L's Biden has taken since 1981? That's insane. He ran for president so many fucking times, man. He has argued that polls aren't fully reflecting voters' concerns about democracy. In response to questions with the story, Biden's advisors told Axios, these people have clearly not heard from Mike or anyone on the team of the president's detailed case for re-election. Oh, yeah, I'll look at the I'll look at the uh, the the trailer to uh, later or on <sighs> on the Tamil genocide. Um, where's the democracy with Biden though? If he's demanding loyalty and rejecting dissent, that's, he's just a fascist. Yeah, no, he's doing Trump shit. Don Alon articulated a nuanced version of this to New Yorkers Evan Osnos earlier this year, saying that January 6th would affect the 2024 election, much like 9/11 was central to the 2004 election. The Democratic Party didn't want to believe it was a 9-11 election, Donalon told Osnos. I decided after that election, I would never be a part of a presidential campaign that didn't figure out with clarity what I wanted to say and stick to it. You are the most delusional man in the United States of America. If you think Americans care about January 6th in the way that they cared about 9-11 three years after 9-11, Americans do not give a shit about January 6th to the same degree. Because January 6th was nowhere near as impactful as 9-11. That is so fucking stupid. January 6th, literally, while it was happening, was a fucking meme. While it was happening. We watched it in real time. It was funny. January 6th was low-key funny as fuck. It was high-key funny as fuck. It was just hilarious. It was a bunch of entitled small business owners trying to fucking take shits on Nancy Pelosi's desk. That's it. The election by the election day this year, Donald Trump believes the focus will become overwhelming on democracy. I think the biggest images in people's minds are going to be of January 6th. This person is this person must be doing the remainder crack cocaine that Hunter Biden left behind in the White House because this is you have to be on crack to think that this is like your election strategy that will work. Like he hasn't even brought up the A word, abortion. What the fuck are we doing? The strategy should be abortion, okay? Not January 6th. If this is one of his top fucking A's that's been around since 1981, holy shit, dude.
These guys are so fucking out of touch. No, not autism. <laughs> Bullshit. Biden's inner circle is cohesive but insular. Aides joke that there's an unofficial no new friends rule. The group includes First Lady Jill Biden's top aide, Anthony Bernal, and the new Deputy Chief of Staff, Annie Tomasini. Low profile but powerful aides who have worked mostly for the Bidens since 2008 and are known for their focus on loyalty. When Tomasini was still the head of the Oval Office operations last year, she and Bernal surprised people by sitting on interviews for Biden's campaign manager, a person involved in the process told Axios. A source familiar with the interviews told Axios this was not a surprise. Annie and Anthony are part of senior advisors group and every senior advisor was part of the interviews. Zoom in. Despite a year head start, a larger campaign team and spending more than twice what Trump's team has spent on ads since early March, Biden's numbers against Trump have largely stayed the same for the past few months with the slight bump after Trump's conviction. During the ad campaigns and Trump's trial, however, Biden's average approval rating hit an all-time low on June 9th with 37.4, uh, with 56.7 disapproving according to 538. His current approval rate is at 38.4%. Longtime Democratic strategist Howard Wolfson, who worked for former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg in the 2020 primary against Biden, told Axios, if the election were today, we would lose. Can that change? Yes. Is it on the path to do so? I don't see that yet. Let's go, Israel. Yes. Let's go, baby. Please kill more children, Israel. Kill more Palestinian children. They are Hamas. The stakes for the debate on June 27th between Biden and Trump are sky high, he said, which is true. So... Um, the Biden team, I think, is still resting on the low expectation move. Everyone's, everyone has, everyone has low expectations on Biden. Everyone thinks Trump is going to fucking clean up and wipe the floor with Biden. If Biden can at least be like a little bit competent, that will be shocking to people. Normally, debates don't matter all that much, but this is a unique circumstance where, like. The campaign strategy has been uh, obviously like wheeling out Biden, uh, you know, as little as possible, basically. So he doesn't get a big time. He doesn't get a big amount of media presence in general, especially uninterrupted, especially live broadcasted media attention, especially in a contentious room against a person like Donald Trump. So this is going to be a unique opportunity um, for voters to see whether or not he still has, uh, you know, everything intact. If he flubs even a little bit, if he flubs even a little bit, it's, it's so bad. It's going to be so fucking bad for him. I'm very excited to watch the debates. Nonetheless, this is, uh, also something that I have been telling you guys about in perpetuity. Eras plus four for Trump. Nevada plus three for Trump, Wisconsin, pro plus three for Trump, Pennsylvania, plus two for Trump, Minnesota, Michigan, plus one for Trump, Minnesota tied. Meanwhile, Senate races, Senate races, you got plus four Dem, plus 12 Dem, plus two Dem, plus six Dem, plus four Dem, plus 11 Dem, plus 11, plus 12. We are looking at a unique circumstance where the down ballot races might carry the top of the ticket to victory. Okay? That is insane. You're you're looking at like you're looking at a 15 point disparity here in either in the opposite direction. That is crazy. This is precisely the reason why I say it's not that people fucking hate the Democratic Party or the Democrats in general. The Democrats are doing great in comparison to how they are normally perceived by the public. The reason for that is because the Republican Party broadly is doing very poorly. Why are they doing very poorly? Because of the same sentiment that Biden uh, and his team are talking about. The, the anti-democracy takes, the abortion shit, like this kind of stuff. It has genuinely soured a lot of the likely voters. A lot of likely voters, especially older, educated white voters that normally fucking vote for the Republican Party, are like, yeah, this shit kind of has gone too far. It's it's a little out of it's a little out of control. I think it's a little chaotic. The Democrats are handing Republic uh, the the Republicans are handing the Democrats an electoral victory. Having said that, however, the Democrats are returning the favor. Dems aren't doing anything. Republicans are just doing way too much. That's not true either. <clears throat> mm. 
Moderate Republicans aren't raging fascists. You mean like moderate Republican voters, you mean? And even if they have a lot of allegiances with like white supremacist opinions and stuff like that, they just don't like the, the way it looks. They get the ick. Normie Republicans, not moderate Republicans, but normie Republicans might be just as racist as any other fucking dude, but they just get a ick from the sweaty psychos. What is this? His President Biden will take the right podium position on CNN's presidential debate after his campaign won a coin flip and Trump will get the last word. What is this? His team won the debate coin toss and gave up having the last word for standing on the right-hand side of the debate. Holy shit. Maybe that's his better side. Except most polls show a split right now. doesn't mean it has the last, but nothing specific to Emerson. Um, so, yeah. So, why did I talk about this? Why did I talk about Biden's re-election chances? Let's get back to the matter at hand here. Because I think focusing on... Focusing on Biden's campaign and, and reading the fucking tea leaves and the way that he operates internally will help you make a better assessment on why the American government has not put the fucking reins on Israel's unhinged behavior. Because the same dynamic very much exists on that front as well, because Israel has become an election issue. Maybe it's not the most significant election issue, but it's still an election issue nonetheless. And it will certainly become a much larger election issue and maybe even the election issue because foreign policy is never the top priority until it's the only priority, okay? That's how it goes in American politics. Most Americans don't really give a shit until that's all they give a shit about. And if Israel invades Lebanon and then forces American soldiers to defend or to also invade Lebanon alongside Israel, if America is forced to offer even more material support to Israel, then that will be the only election issue that people care about. Because that's just like, you know, one step removed from World War III, especially if Iran gets involved. Having said that, however, it's not like the situation looks great for Biden's re-election nonetheless. So even if... 10% of the voter base, let's say, hypothetically, care about Gaza, right? He still needs that 10%. He, he needs it so much, and yet he's not looking for it. He's not trying to get it. That's the reason why I talked about his re-election campaign, because I wanted you to understand there are voices in the State Department, there are voices in American politics right now that are trying to say, we got to reign Israel. We got to reign in Israel. We got to reign in Israel. There are people who are saying that. There are people in the State Department. There are people amongst the generals because they see the writing on the wall. They see that this is, Israel's actions are becoming increasingly more chaotic and harming American soft power, harming America's uh, uh, capabilities, harming America's military power, making America look like it is powerless in front of its ally. It's powerless in, in influencing its ally and offering unconditional, unlimited support to its most significant ally in the region. It makes America look weak, okay? In a way, this is a continuation of Donald Trump making America look ridiculous in the global stage, okay? It's also harming Israel's future prospects. Israel becoming a pariah state ultimately will lead to the dissolution and the end of the apartheid. So I believe that, that is a, there's a good ending to that story, but there's a lot of bad that will happen in the process because these kinds of fascist nations famously do not go out without flinging as much dirt and hurting as many people in the region as possible. That means deaths. More children dying, more women dying, more men dying, more buildings being demolished. Okay? And Biden has created a hug box, an echo chamber of sorts, in the way that he is dealing with this very significant foreign policy issue. That this was coming, but clearly they're concerned given the growing military ties between Israel and Cyprus that somehow Israel will use 
Cyprus's airports or bases, as he said, uh, to launch attacks on Lebanon and particularly uh, Hezbollah. So he issued this rather surprising warning against Cyprus. Now, the response of the Cypriots uh, was that, uh, for instance, the president yesterday came out and said this was not a pleasant remark coming from uh, Nasrallah and that he insisted that Cyprus wants no part in any war or conflict, as he said. And we heard also uh, from a spokesman from, for the Cypriot government this morning uh, saying that no, that Cypriot territory would not be used in any uh, military activity if it comes uh, to a war. But clearly, uh, Hezbollah is concerned not only about what could come from the south, but also clearly what might come from the west as well. Becky? Ben, the Cypriot president, as you rightly pointed out, has responded. Very specifically, he said, what I have to respond to is that the Republic of Cyprus is in no way involved in the war conflicts. The Republic of Cyprus is not part of the problem, he said. The Republic of Cyprus is part of the solution. And our role in this, as demonstrated, for example, through the humanitarian corridor, he's talking there about the maritime corridor between Cyprus um, and Gaza is recognized not only by the Arab world, but by the international community as a whole. Um, so I think it's important that we just um, explain for the viewers what role Cyprus has had over the course of this war um, and, and how they have been involved. Well, certainly they were a, a sort of a transit point for humanitarian goods headed uh, to that mm. rather ill-fated or so far not very successful uh, U.S. pier that cost U.S. taxpayers $340 million to bring in uh, humanitarian goods to Gaza along, and also that includes the... Uh Two points. One, isn't Biden just relying on old moderate Republicans and Dems who love the status quo and will vote for him? Two, given that Trump would only escalate aid and U.S. involvement to help Israel against Iran, how is this an effective criticism of Biden? Because currently, Joseph Robinette Biden is the president. Donald Trump is not the president. Why would you vote for Joseph Robinette Biden for president if he's not going to listen to any of the reasonable demands that you are making in terms of stopping a fucking ethnic cleansing campaign? Because Later down the line, the other side will be worse. People don't think like this. And I think that this way of thinking is also self-defeating regardless. You're giving the game away when you say stuff like that. It's the same exact reason as to why Biden is doing what he's doing on the right-wing immigration strategy. It is, a, it is genuinely a bad strategy in terms of dealing with the problem. It also has massive long-term consequences shifting American politics further and further to the right. But yeah, Biden is trash, but on this point in question, Trump is worse, is not going to be something that drives you over the finish line. Most people do not engage in defensive voting. The people that you know, and maybe you do, right? You do lesser evil voting. But that strategy only yields more right-wing attitudes down the line, okay? participation of 1,000 U.S. service people as well. Now, Cyprus is in an interesting position. I recall during the 70s and 80s, it did not have very good relationship with Israel. In fact, there was a case where uh, the Cypriot authorities arrested several Israelis uh, who they believed were involved in sabotage or attempts to assassinate Palestinian members of the PL members of the PLO at the time. But as a result of the deterioration of Israeli-Turkish relations going back to the 2010 Mavi Marmara incident, where Israeli commanders bo commandos boarded a Turkish ship that was headed to Gaza, killing several people on board that ship, those relations have deteriorated, keeping in mind, of course, that Turkey essentially contro has controlled the northern part of Cyprus since 1975. So essentially, the Cypriot government is looking at it as, you know, the enemy of our enemy is our friend. All very complicated in a very Middle Eastern... Yeah.
That's crazy. Um, the notion that like Turku will do something that is anti-Israel, like genuinely anti-Israel is ridiculous. Turkey is NATO, okay? Which is America. There's no fucking way in hell that they would utilize like Northern Cyprus or anything like that. Sort of way, uh, but that sort of puts Cyprus on the map in terms of where they stand at the moment regarding uh, the tensions between Lebanon and Israel. Mm. Becky? You're right to point out that this is, uh, this is a multi-layered um, conflict. Um, and of course, Israel warning of the prospect of all-out war after Hezbollah um, published purported drone footage of civilian and military um, installations uh, in Israel. Can you explain how lesser evil voting breeds right-wing sentiment? Yes. Um, you can Google any number of videos that I've done on this matter specifically, but um, most, most recently, I think the, the greatest example I can give you is something that I already mentioned while talking about it, which is the right-wing sentiment that America has that has become increasingly closer and closer to fascism in terms of dealing with undocumented migrants in this country. Joe Biden ran against Donald Trump's white nativist immigration strategy. Americans were not happy with Donald Trump's right-wing uh, white nativist reactionary anti-migrant strategy. Remember the kids in cages? People hated that shit. Okay? People hated that. And yet, at that time, at that time, Biden had a 100-day plan for how he was going to offer amnesty, close the cages, you know, have a much more fair and humanitarian asylum process. He didn't do any of those things. He did not do any of those things. And Republicans kept hitting the uh, immigration line over and over again, saying immigration is out of control. Immigration is out of control. Crime is out of control. Immigrants are doing crime. And what did the Democratic Party do? Four years later, the Democratic Party is now adopting the positions of Donald Trump from 2020 in terms of immigration. When the Democratic Party capitulates to the right-wing framing on issues, they don't actually win over voters. They simply legitimize the problem born out of hysteria. Republicans delicately and desperately craft this narrative and then when the Democrats say, yeah, that, that actually is true, all of a sudden, the country now has a 60% approval on mass deportations of all undocumented migrants living on U.S. soil. That number is terrifying. Because what does that mean? That means we're going to do camps, okay? We already have camps at the border. We're going to do even more camps where we concentrate specific subsects of American society. We're going to have to greatly beef up our Customs and Border Patrol. We're going to most likely start utilizing BORTAC more and more inside of U.S. soil. BORTAC is the Special Weapons and Tactics Team, the military wing of Customs and Border Patrol. Those guys are not beholden to the American Constitution. They do not. They, are, they operate without any scrutiny. They can violate your due process. They can uh, engage in indefinite detentions. They can do whatever the fuck they want. Who, by the way, will immediately bring up a few good things. Uh, the few good things that Brandon has actually done. I am that person. I talk about the good things that Brandon has actually done. I have no issue being honest about that. I think the IRA was good. I think lowering pharmaceutical prices for insulin is good. I, don't, I, I think pulling out of Afghanistan is good. There are a lot of things that Biden has done that are objectively good. They're not the best, but they're objectively on the right side, okay, in the right direction. Pre-October 7, there was definitely things that you could point to. The problem is post-October 7, he's, you know, dropped the ball so dramatically, showing up to the UAW picket line, having an NLRB that is, like, way more effective in, in uh, going after business owners that are routinely violating labor laws and labor protections. FTC, the SEC, the IRS, these, all of these federal agencies are actually working, okay? The limited amount of student loan debt relief that he engaged in, also not bad, could be better, and he certainly promised more. The FTC and the DOJ actually working to break up monopolies, yeah. The problem is they're not even fucking, um, the problem is that these guys, I already mentioned the infrastructure bill, 
Um, the, the problem is these guys are not even promoting that shit because the branding camp seemingly has made this calculation that they want to appear as moderate and as right, as center right as possible. They want to be, they saw that there was no reasonable Republican out there. So they were like, instead of constantly hitting that note that there are no reasonable Republicans, they chose to become the reasonable Republicans. So even when they're doing progressive shit, they don't even fucking promote it out of fear that the suburb whites could turn on a dime. That's crazy. At least back in the day, lesser evil voting meant that, at least back in the day, lesser evil voting meant that like you would at least like stop the creep towards fascism a little bit. Nowadays, in this climate, in this election cycle, lesser evil voting simply means you are going to be advocating for the same positions you ran against in the same four-year cycle. It's crazy. Lesser evil voting has officially turned into vote for us so we can do the cruelty, but just four years after. Um, Hezbollah, of course, have said, uh, has said that their efforts against Israel will continue as long as the Israel-Hamas war continues, as long as the conflict in Gaza continues. Ben, thank you. And that does continue. For aid into oh, crossing sorry. between Israel and Egypt has been a, a vital point for aid into Gaza, of course. Now, new video and satellite images reviewed by CNN show the passenger terminal on the Gaza side has been burned and severely damaged. The Israeli military conducted significant bulldozing and clearing at the terminal earlier this month, causing more destruction to a main building already damaged by fire in late May. We turn now to that new Louisiana. I think, oh, we're going to talk about Louisiana as well. I think one of the best examples that I've used in terms of lesser evil voting being a fucking idiotic, or not lesser evil voting, but like the Democratic Party strategy here being idiotic is the example I've given you before, okay? On the one hand, you have Bernie Sanders who wants Medicare for all. Let's say in a hypothetical universe, Bernie Sanders wins the Democratic primary in 2016, okay? Advocating for universal health care, Medicare for all specifically. Donald Trump, being the room reader that he is, starts advocating for universal health care. Does that automatically mean that people are going to turn around and vote for Donald Trump because he's the Medicare for all candidate? Or are people just going to go, see, even Trump is advocating for Medicare for all. I am now more, I now feel even more confident that we have to have Medicare for all. Of course, I'm going to vote for the Medicare for all guy. The problem with Joe Biden and this current White House is that they think that they can do the reverse of that by pushing right-wing framing on immigration. When you push right-wing framing on immigration, nobody's going to turn around and be like, well, that's why I'm voting for Joe Biden because he's the anti-immigrant candidate. No, all of the people are going to be like, see, Trump was fucking right. If anything, you are going to turn around and maybe even if you were less, like even if you personally were maybe a lifelong Republican who thinks like Trump is a little bit too chaotic for your taste, you're going to turn around and be like, well, he was right on immigration and I don't trust Joe Biden to do a good job. He certainly had four years to do a good job and he didn't do it. And now he's even he's admitting that immigration is a fucking problem. And these guys are like doing mass rapes. These undocumented markets are doing mass rapes. This is something that is playing out in every neoliberal European country as well. You have center right and center parties, neoliberal parties, liberal parties that are desperately trying to capture the attention of as many like center, center right and far right voters as possible by leaning in the rightward direction. And all that it is, all that that has done so far is basically galvanize the far right, basically legitimize the far right. It didn't happen on accident. It didn't happen out of fucking nowhere. It's a major miscalculation. History is repeating itself. This is the Nazi rise to power unfolding right in front of our eyes. Okay. Liberals did the exact same shit back then. Yeah. The, uh, the American prospect wrote about exactly this capital won't love you back. Mr. President billionaire chief of staff, Jeffrey Zients epitomizes a campaign that has been less force, less than forceful about the rally to, of capital to Donald Trump's side. Huh. Capital won't love you back. Mr. President partner scrutinizes the executive branch and presidential power. Follow them at the revolving door project.org. 
Donald Trump held court before America's wealthiest CEOs last Thursday at a meeting of the Business Roundtable, a powerful D.C. lobbying group. Trump supposedly floated eliminating federal income taxes and replacing the revenue with tariffs, an awful idea that would make the rich much richer, the poor much poorer, and maybe even delegitimize the dollar. To CEOs who have been outsourcing production for 40 years, super high taxes on imports probably didn't sound so great either. Back in 2021, the Business Roundtable denounced the January 6th insurrection. Today, many of its members have already endorsed Trump's campaign. As the prospects David Dayan wrote on Friday, concentrated wealth is unifying behind one candidate, from Wall Street to Silicon Valley to the oil patch. The forces of capital are falling in line behind America's homegrown fascist, who has only grown more unhinged, violent, and grievance-fueled since he descended that damn escalator nearly a decade ago. President Biden has been ramping up high-dollar fundraisers of his own, of course, but so far these have mostly been with celebrities and media figures, many of whom were on strike last year. These people are rich, but they're not oligarchic. According to Open Secrets, 69% of Trump's campaign cash comes from large donors. Republicans have received a staggering $508 million in direct campaign contributions and super PAC or party committee giving from the 100 families that have donated the most wealth in this campaign cycle, three times the $169 million these families have given to Democrats. In policy terms, big business is certain that Trump will slash their taxes even lower, deregulate their industries even further, attack unions even more harshly, and so on. Trump even described his demand of a $1 billion tithe from big oil as a deal for the destruction of U.S. environmental protections. The man does make the subtext text. Clearly, the billionaire class isn't so put off by Trump's social politics that they won't do everything they can to make him the most powerful man on earth. In fact, some of them positively love the bigotry. In my book, finding white supremacy uncouth, but not disqualifying, does not redeem anyone. The proper term for fascism apologist is fascist. Joe Biden might see this as an electoral opportunity, especially given that his personal hero was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. FDR's first re-election in 1936 was supposed to be a nail-biter, but turned into a landslide. Why? Millions of working-class Americans who'd never voted before turned out for Roosevelt, because he welcomed the hatred of the ultra-wealthy economic royalists. In the words of an unnamed 1936 factory worker, quoted in Michael Kazin's History of the Democratic Party, Mr. Roosevelt is the only man we ever had in the White House who would understand that my boss is a son of a bitch. Would workers say the same of Joe Biden today? If not, why? Recall the business roundtable confab with Trump last Thursday. Less remarked upon, and more telling of why a second Trump term is so terrifyingly probable, was that he was only one of the speakers. Representing the other side, and attending in Biden's place while he was at the G7, was current White House Chief of Staff Jeff Zients. If Trump's talent is saying out loud what the rich are thinking, Zions's talent is saying out loud what the rich want to hear. As I've written for The Prospect before, Zions became a billionaire through management consulting, essentially being paid to give businessmen permission to be cruel. He then became the Obama White House's go-between for corporate America, once telling a group of CEOs, you are the customers of Obama's economic policy. Zion spent the Trump years investing in surprise medical billing firms, then became Biden's first COVID-19 czar in 2021. He failed miserably, that winter, Zion's left Americans short on masks, tests, and treatments, all of which the administration could have produced domestically via the Defense Production Act, after ignoring months of pleas by epidemiologists to stockpile early. Biden re- Anyway, um, the entire point is, this is basically saying exactly what I've been saying, which is that Biden doesn't even fucking hype up uh, pro-labor legislation that they they have advocated for before. They don't even have any fucking policies on the campaign website, which is insane. You hear nothing about the bills that Democrats have in the tank. You don't even hear about a plan to take Congress back in the first place. What issues Biden does engage on, he frames in exclusively negative terms. This adds on abortion, for example, feature rightful condemnation of Trump, but no actual promises to restore Roe v. Wade much less make bodily autonomy a basic legal right in this country. He assures viewers that he will protect what's left of the right to choose, which is now a state-level issue in practice, so the White House can't do much anyway, but not that he will try to restore and expand anyone's rights through new national legislation or constitutional amendments. I follow politics more closely than people, as far as I can tell. The campaign's only clear promise is to stave off Trumpism for a few more years. While, because this is a little bit more libbed up of an article than my assessment of it, They're not just saying they're going to stave off Trumpism for a few more years. They're saying they're going to 
stave off Trumpism for a few more years while doing some of the Trump policies themselves. And that's very damaging. Now the Biden administration has some genuine, even populist successes in the Zenith era, but they've mostly come from independent agencies and their directors like Rohit Chopra at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Lena Khan at the Federal Trade Commission, Jennifer Abruzzo at the National Labor Relations Board. These are the GOATs. These are the agencies. These are the agencies that will be destroyed uh, as they were already reduced to basically nothing under the Trump administration. But, but, why are you hearing this only from me? I don't even like Biden. I hate Biden. Biden is a genocidal freak. Why am I talking about his fucking dubs and he's not? Think about that. What the fuck are they doing? I cover the news and I and I have a close I, I watch closely what the Democratic Party is doing and what the re-election campaign is doing. And I promise you, I promise you, I fucking despise Biden as you guys know. Okay? I have talked significantly more about this administration's W's than the administration itself. What the fuck is going on? Is it a conspiracy or are they just this incompetent? They're incompetent and they're scared. Okay? That's what it is. They're afraid of genuinely advocating for something. They're in the don't rock the boat camp always. That's what the problem is. They're not only incompetent, but they're afraid. They are pussies. They're afraid of standing for something. And beyond that, they're afraid that they're going to lose out. They're going to lose out on <coughs> the suburban whites, older suburban white voters that they're actually cleaning up at the moment. They think that the old suburban whites are going to fucking deliver them an electoral victory because they do not think that Donald Trump or the Republican Party in general can clean up and pick, like they can pick more suburban white voters that are lifelong Republicans than the Republican Party can pick up young people and black people and brown people, okay? That is the calculation. In the most reductive way I can explain it to you, this is what is going on. They look at the table and they say, we got these lifelong voters. They will always vote no matter what. We can win them over to our side. They seemingly are on our side. And the Republicans, because they run on racism, not pick up enough young voters and they cannot pick up enough black and brown voters in general. Okay? That's the calculation. That is what they believe in. And they care so much about picking up the uh, other like Republican, more, more moderate, more normy Republican voters. They care so much about that that they refuse to even talk about their dubs to an audience that could be potentially receptive to it. This has always been a fear for the Democratic Party, by the way. The Democratic Party despises the left-wing shift and, and the, the leftists within its ranks more than they hate Republicans. They despise the left. They despise progressive politics. Let's be real. They see progressives as spoilers. They see progressives as, as people that have conviction, and they hate that. They hate conviction. They hate having... Uh, uh, they hate people standing on their, their ideological, moral convictions. They do not like that at all because it fucks up the bag for them because ultimately they are beholden to the same corporate masters that the Republican Party is beholden to. So at the end of the day, they can't rock the boat too much. They can't actually fucking push for policies that they claim to care about in order to win elections. Okay. Oh, anyway. If Zian said disapproved that they're antagonizing Washington big tech ahead of an election, he could not have stopped them. Moreover, Biden has done little to tout these accomplishments from his team. His communication officials routinely balk at even talking about actions against big business. If this was meant to show corporate America that Biden isn't as scary as the Wall Street Journal editorial board makes him out to be, clearly it hasn't worked. It ne never could. It is abundantly clear to the world that Joe Biden is a capitalist in all of his speeches. It's why moderates united behind him in the 2020 primary. It's something anyone with a passing knowledge of his 50 years in national politics can tell you. The C-suites are fully aware that Joe Biden is not a socialist bent on their destruction. They don't care because they care about maxing out profits. And they don't care what happens in that process because they can always avoid scrutiny. They can always avoid the worst impacts. Okay? It's destructive. But it doesn't matter. As long as it yields higher profit margins in the next 
uh, in the next quarterly earnings report, then they're fine. They're happy. And they see Trump as that destroyer. They did not forget that Donald Trump gave them massive, massive fucking tax cuts. Okay. If Zients actually did unite the formidable power of industry behind Biden instead of Trump, or at least keep big money even evenly distributed in the race, I'd have to grudgingly admit that it was effective. As Lyndon Johnson once said, there's nothing more useless than a dead liberal. But that has not happened. Just as they have for 50 years, the captains of industry are mostly lining up behind the Republican. Whatever his ideology, clearly Biden doesn't think the business world should have at least some set of checks on its power sometimes. That is enough for the billionaire class to prefer the fascist. Given all of this, what's the point of continuing to wear kid gloves on the campaign trail? Biden has shut his trap about the most exciting parts of his domestic agenda for two years in hopes of keeping capital from backing Trump, and he's gotten practically nothing for it. Doesn't that sound creepily similar to his unconditional loyalty to Benjamin Netanyahu? He is experiencing the same issue on two different fronts. He's like, these are the things I believe I don't care if these guys literally fucking say, fuck you, I don't want you. I don't care if these guys personally are working against my reelection because I believe these things and I will push for these things no matter what. It is very frustrating. This instinct is so bad. They have no political instincts and they are just operating on pure fear at a time when they should be pouncing on the Republican Party. Okay, they should be eviscerating the Republican Party, but they're not. Ugh. Left February, right today. Prem writes, Biden's biggest loyalist may be hurting his campaign the most. Too devoted to consider constructively pushing him to stop losing support from the broader base that would otherwise carry him to win. And so long as Team Biden thinks he has his loyalist, they'll think it's enough. And then the right is the Axios article that we just read. Anyway, the last part of the Israel equation was U.S. concerned Israel's Iron Dome could be overwhelmed in war with Hezbollah, officials say. U.S. officials have serious concerns that in the event of a full-blown war between Israel and Hezbollah, the Iran-backed militant group could overwhelm Israel's air defenses in the north, including the much va vaunted Iron Dome air defense system, three officials told CNN. Fears, which the U.S. officials said have also been communicated to them by Israel, that the Iron Dome could be vulnerable to Hezbollah's vast arsenal of missiles and drones, are only rising as Israel has increasingly indicated to U.S. officials that it is preparing for a land and air incursion into Lebanon. Israeli officials have told the U.S. that they're planning to shift resources from southern Gaza to northern Israel in, prepare, in preparation for a possible offensive against the group. U.S. officials told CNN on Wednesday, we assess that at least some Iron Dome batteries will be overwhelmed, said a senior administration official. An Israeli official said that would be more likely if Hezbollah conducted a large-scale attack, principally using precision-guided weapons, which could be challenging for the system to defend against. These are not the Yasin bathtub rockets. These are not even the rockets that Hezbollah has been using for the most part. This is an ethno-nationalist fascist state opening up a new front of war while they are in the process of doing an ethnic cleansing campaign. And if history doesn't repeat itself, but it surely rhymes, we are in, the, in that stage. This is Nazi Germany through and through, okay? Almost one-to-one. -one. Hezbollah has been showing that they have the capabilities of passing the Iron Dome defenses. They've done it. They've done so this past week with the drone footage that they showed from inside of Israel in Haifa. This will be incredibly deadly incredibly bloody okay this will have devastating consequences for israelis it will have an unforeseen uh consequences like previously like consequences that people previously did not think could ever happen in israel the perceived veil of security that israelis uh think they still have will be shattered once more in a way that is significantly worse, in my opinion, than October 7. <sighs> Obviously, southern Lebanon and Lebanon as a whole will experience far worse consequences than Israel will in this process, as we know how Israel conducts its affairs. Israel doesn't just wage war against a standing military. Israel wages war against the civilian population. This is a part of their military doctrine. Okay? This is how they operate. This is how they have operated in the past in Lebanon. So it's not even new. 
Israel has invaded Lebanon and failed in the past. Where is the, where is the food? Sorry, I ordered food and I'm waiting for it. And it's supposed to be outside, but it's not. Anyway. Where is it? What the hell's going on? Oh, they're not here yet. I intercepted it. Yeah, she's... What? Hold on. One second. Sorry. Anyway, let's get back to American domestic politics. Louisiana. Awesome new rule in Louisiana. Louisiana law requiring the Ten Commandments to be displayed in every public school classroom. Will Reeve joins us with more about it and the expected legal challenges. Good morning, Will. Good morning, Rebecca. Whatever your knowledge of or adherence to, to the Ten Commandments, those ethical imperatives inherent to Judaism and Christianity, if you're in a Louisiana public school classroom, they're going to be up on the wall. That according to a new Louisiana law requiring the Ten Commandments to be displayed in every public classroom in the state from kindergarten all the way through state-funded universities by the start of 2025. The commandments must be on a poster-sized display with, quote, easily readable font and include a four-paragraph context statement detailing how the Ten Commandments were, quote, a prominent part of American public education for almost three centuries, according to the legislation drafted by the Louisiana GOP. Opponents say it's unconstitutional, that it's an egregious melding of church and state. Supporters say the purpose of the measure is not solely religious, that the Ten Commandments have historical significance. And, Will, this is going to face immediate legal challenges. Yeah, that's exactly right, Rebecca. Pre previous efforts to require the Ten Commandments to be displayed in public schools have been shut down by the Supreme Court. Legislators this time around hope that any suit brought before the Supreme Court would be met more favorably by its conservative majority. Currently, similar bills have been proposed in Texas, Oklahoma, and Utah, but thus far, Louisiana is the only state to successfully turn such a bill into law. All right, something to watch. We'll see how it plays out. Will, thank you so much. Trad wives living trad lives. Ivy Van Dusen is a self-proclaimed traditional wife. I recommend getting ready, doing some makeup, putting on a cute outfit before you see your husband. My brand is embracing motherhood and enjoying motherhood. If you've been on social media, you've probably seen the hashtag, beautiful women cooking, cleaning, and embracing life as stay-at-home moms. These glossy, gorgeous videos showcasing life Ugh. seemingly plucked out of history. I love that there's a nightline on this trend. Hey, hey, get out of there. What are you doing? Place. Don't want to get theological here, but what is the average Muslim consensus towards the Ten Commandments? What? I don't think Muslims think about the Ten Commandments at all. You know who does, though? Trad wives do. Most Christians don't think about them either. Yeah, or they definitely don't abide by them. This kind of stuff is just a flex, okay? That's what this is. All this is doing is just flexing. Flexing the muscle. Flexing the might. Showing the country that are, are showing those who do care about this kind of shit that they have the capability and the power and the interest to do it. Turn off autoplay? Why? Shut the fuck up. Why would I turn off autoplay? Okay, I'm being rude. I need to dial back my rudeness. I'm sorry for saying shut the fuck up. But also, why would I do that? I'm hangry. I think it's just that this is flex mode for the Republican Party. Come on, honestly, I know you're into trial wives. Yeah, I don't give a fuck. There are YouTube vids of people showing hold. Yeah, but this is a playlist chatter. The Republican strategy seemingly has been, at the state level especially, go as hard as you fucking can. Go as hard as you can, YOLO mode. We don't care about like, we don't care about what this, what this um, potentially shows to the rest of the American public about like what could happen if the Republicans won. They're just, like I said, that's why I'm saying like they're going YOLO mode. 18.55, okay. Yeah, to answer that chatter's question, like I repeat, I will repeat once again. I do not give a fuck about the trad wives. I do think, however, it's just sex work. That's all trap wives are. It's sex work. Anyone that doesn't see it as that is deluding themselves. All right, let's continue. The definition of a trad wife is not merely someone who stays at home, but who romanticizes it in a sort of retro nostalgic way where we are looking back not only to the way things worked in the 50s, but the values that families had in the 50s. The unofficial queen of the trad wife movement, Nara Smith. The 22-year-old former model and mother of three, followed by millions. 
Other TikTok stars like Esty Williams also proudly tagging their content. It's a trend launching think pieces and op-eds all around the world. There's a new generation though of young women. They are proudly embracing this label of trad wife. This trad wife, I guess it's a Gen Z thing. I'm sorry, 50 years ago was not a place I ever want to be back. Exactly. <laughs> but there could be more at work here. A recent study found that trad wife content on less regulated platforms like YouTube and X, formerly known as Twitter, could steer social media users down the rabbit hole of radical far-right content and misinformation, something podcasters and YouTubers are picking up on. Whether trad wives intend to or not, their policy serve as a starting point for alt-right radicalization. But as the trend rises, American women are trying to avoid a new culture war, pitting moms who work against the moms who choose to stay home. I think for a lot of women, work is not necessary, it's a preference. What do you say to the commenters who say you're setting women back 50 years? Oh, I just disagree completely. Do you ever get criticized for being a working mom? On social media, there's a lot of criticism of like, who's raising your kids right now? The trend recently hit a boiling point after Kansas City Chiefs kicker Harrison Butker said this in a commencement speech last month. So I think it is you, the women, who have had the most diabolical lies told to you. I loved what he had to say about motherhood. Um, I didn't really find an issue with it at all. But how does that work in a modern society where more than 56% of American women are in the workforce, significantly more than in 1950? It's such a simple little toy, but it's really educational. Ivy says she always wanted to be a mom. So this is just one piece. I think the inherent irony of trad wife content is that like, they literally talk about staying at home in the kitchen and presenting themselves as like traditional wives, right? Barefoot and pregnant except they're still working. They're literally making money. The major reason as to why 56% of women work is because it's impossible to have a fucking one income household that is sustainable. Everything is too goddamn expensive. How are you going to pay for fucking rent? How are you going to pay for the $5 a month subscription to the Hasanabi broadcast? You can't do it on your own. You need a partner to pick up the slack. You need a partner maybe with a boyfriend who has an Amazon Prime account that you can connect to your Twitch account and steal their Amazon Prime Twitch account for your own. Make it your own and subscribe at the top of the hour so you avoid the three minute ad break. Here's a three minute ad break now, by the way. So when you were in college studying broadcast journalism, did you have a dream job? I've always wanted to be a mom, to be honest with you. And that doesn't even sound like your classic dream job, but I did just want a family. Now mom to two boys, she juggles snack time and craft time with content creation. What does being a child wife mean to you? Obviously just a traditional wife. I think a lot of people unfortunately kind of have this negative view of the way people used to live. I was really close with my grandma and with my both my grandmothers and even my great grandmother and they were just like the coolest women. When I hear homemaker, when I hear traditional woman, I think of really amazing women. The trad wife lifestyle is sold as one that is relaxing and beautiful for the people who participate in it and for the husbands and the families who benefit from it. It is a vision of a lifestyle that is not really attainable. Nowadays, it's often a privilege to have a single income sustaining an entire family. Government yeah. statistics show more than half of all U.S. households, 54%, have two incomes. That's more than double the number from 1955. Not to mention more than 80% of all single parents are moms. There's an economic impact and that giving up that financial independence is actually putting not just you, but your kids' future at risk. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like, I have a degree. I have things I could do. Women like me have thought about that. And we know that things can go wrong. We, the Bro, you are doing things. You're doing the thing. Your presentation is the thing. Like, when you're talking about being a trad wife and making money off of the influencer shit that you're doing, you're literally still working. This inherently is so stupid. Like, the, uh, the conversation is so dumb. That's why I'm always like, listen, this is straight up. It's just straight up fucking sex work for right wingers. So many of the lonely losers online hunting for a trad wife just want a partner who has no friends or coworkers. Therefore, because she can never cheat or leave them. For the men, that's what so much of it boils down to. Control just like homeschooling. Damn, M Hood. Coming out. Coming out with some smoke for homeschooling. You made it out all right. The Hudson brothers made it out all right. They all became Hasanabi heads. Why is homeschooling legal? Because we are a freak nation. Okay. 
that's why straight up we are literally the freakest of freak nations like it it blows my mind that it is legal it is just so weird the pros for me outweigh the cons and the reward outweighs the risk and yet research shows as women get older they bear a heavier financial burden especially after death or divorce the average age of widowhood is 59 years old but women on average live decades longer uh -huh. ivy says she and her husband choose this life knowing the financial sacrifices i will make a list at the beginning of the week of what we're having for dinner the list is based on the ads from the grocery stores around here it's all electronic so i have all my grocery apps it takes so much time and so much like planning i feel like i do a good job of pretending like i have new things but it's all thrift stores it's all facebook marketplace this is like bro why isn't this lady asking how much money are you making being a trad wife content creator like how much financial support are you offering your husband while claiming that this is a one parent income one parent income household like what do you mean it's so odd oh it's really tough on us it's like is it because you're still working goodwill my other dresses are goodwill i do not call myself a trad wife i call myself a classic wife a really a classic mom for abby roth social media has allowed her to share her more abby conservative roth. views including oh. strong opinions on the roles of men. i guess that's her husband's last name I was about to say, that's Abigail Shapiro, baby. Ben Shapiro's sister, for those of you who don't know. That literally is Ben Shapiro's sister. I'm not joking. I, I, mean, I forget that maybe some people are not as tapped in to the lore. Also known as Classically Abby. It is weird that Brett Cooper looks more like Ben Shapiro as a woman than Abigail Shapiro does, even though she's Ben's sister. Men and women. Men are definitely in a position to protect and and make sure that mom can do what she needs to do so the kids get nurtured. And that's the thing that really breaks my heart is the women who would love to stay at home, but just feel like they can't, feel like they shouldn't, feel like they have too many other obligations to their potential. The little fish in there? The Orthodox Jew and opera singer stepped away from her life on stage and often talks about the expectations women have about career and family. A lot of women are told that they're going to find their fulfillment and they're going to fulfill their potential by their, through their careers. And then it's harder and harder to meet men. And then they find themselves alone and it's hard. If you look at somebody's tombstone, that's what it's going to say. Wonderful daughter, wonderful mother, wonderful wife. It's not going to say wonderful CEO. Like Ivy, Abby says she's not against moms who work. She understands that single moms and two-income households are a reality. But... Women have always had a role economically. It just needs to be put in its proper place. I think for a lot of women, work is not necessary. It's a preference. Even though there's this what? narrative that being at home means you are giving up your career and giving up your dreams. Work is not necessary. It's a preference. What crack pipe are you smoking on, Abby? No, it absolutely is. I'm certain that if given the opportunity, plenty of women and men, as a matter of fact, would love to be stay at home dads and moms. Okay. It's just that you can't really do that because you have to pay rent. What the fuck are we talking about? Why is she making it seem like this is totally voluntary? Like women are in the workforce for the funsies and not because they have to eat food and have a roof over their fucking heads and also beyond that beyond that obviously like it's it the the problem with trad wifing i guess is that they promote all aspects of this like supposedly mythical time in the 50s when women were much happier when obviously that is objectively not true because once given the opportunity women did t seize on the opportunity of entering the workforce so I don't really understand why they make this argument. Like, it's not actually what they're presenting to you, even though they try to act like it's simply just a different lifestyle choice. It's all the other shit that they're not showing you that, you know, people are looking for. It's a cultural signifier for pressing and controlling women's lives as the, uh, you know, bringing it back to a time when they were just simply your property, you know, which is ironic. Because in the 50s, if you were trying to make trad wife content, your husband would come home and beat your fucking ass because the soup was too cold or shitty. 
or because he was just angry about some other things like, I don't know, black people getting rights or something. When you have children, children become your dream in a lot of ways. But many women think you don't have to choose. Dr. Karen Tang is a board-certified OBGYN, surgeon, and book author. She's also been married for nearly 20 years and is the proud working mother of three kids. Do you ever get criticized for being a working mom? And it's not just myself, but actually other women physicians that I know on social media, there's a lot of criticism of like, who's raising your kids right now? And why did you have kids if you can't raise them? No one would say that to a man. Go. You're a bit of a TikTok sensation. Oh my God. <laughs> I joke that I'm a geriatric TikToker because like age-wise, I could be the mom of pretty much everyone else on TikTok. So, so kind of sealing like it close, like right underneath right there. As a parent, yeah, specifically like, a working mom, Karen worries that the trad wife trend leaves out the important and often difficult parts of parenthood. It's almost more of like an aesthetic. Like I think a lot of people who see like trad wives on social media know it's a little bit of a performance. Some of the criticism of the trad wife movement is that it pushes women back to not just a 50s aesthetic, but a 50s mindset. Women didn't have rights. You couldn't have a credit card or a bank account. So I think romanticizing this idea of going back in time but not remembering the realities is dangerous. What do you make of the fact that when you start engaging with the trad wives hashtag, you start getting things like misinformation and conspiracy theories on your For You page. Exactly. It's no longer just that this is a wonderful way to, you know, like choose to live your life. It's become uh, associated with misinformation. Don't let your hands touch the <laughs> Being so busy means Dr. Tang and her husband share the... It's so funny that we're just like, it's just repackaged misogyny. <laughs> like, that's all it is. I ultimately don't care about it because it's like, it's whatever, it's all, like all aesthetics. And in and of itself, when it moves beyond sex work and becomes too preachy, people do move away from that a little bit. So you have to, you know, re-triangulate your trad wife content by saying the n-word and trying to, you know, desperately cultivate a larger right-wing audience, you know? That escalated quickly, don't, hey man, that's what they're doing. A normal OnlyFans sex worker to trad wife content creator pipeline to right-wing charlatan pipeline is, is active. One of many of the uh, wonderful routes that are available, readily available for people, okay? You also have the sex worker to crystal influencer, then to right-wing influencer pipeline, like the anti-vaxxer route. It's awesome. Household duties. How untraditional are the gender roles in your family? I don't know. I, I... What do you mean you don't care about it if it's repackaged misogyny? Don't you care about the misogyny aspect then? And that's making misogyny worse? Yes, I don't care. I'm a man and I'm a misogynistic. And you're totally not misunderstanding either voluntarily to chirp in the chat or ultimately not misunderstanding the point at all. I'm saying I don't care about it as far as aesthetics goes, as far as like it being sex work. But the moment that they start trying to package it with like actual right wing framing, because it's not misogyny if you're simply just saying like, I like being a stay at home mom. That is not inherently misogynistic. Okay. It's not inherently misogynistic to be like, I like the choice. I'm very profoundly fortunate that uh, I, I'm so privileged and so fortunate that like I can live this lifestyle, okay? Nobody wants to fucking work. It's not a bad thing. But the moment that you move away from that and start talking about like how women should be devoid of agency and that this lifestyle isn't just about, I don't know, making fucking cookies from scratch or whatever. But instead, it's actually about like how women should do this. This is their place in society and advocating to remove that aspect of choice. Well, then it, I think, personally starts, starts making this, this type of content like less sexy for those who want to jerk off to it anyway. Does that make sense? Because ultimately, that's all this is, is sex work. And when sex work starts getting preachy, people are like, oh, well, I can't jerk off to this anymore. I definitely have had people tell me that I'm a full-time dad, which <laughs> I think is kind of a funny way to put it, but like, yeah, I, I take on a lot of things that I think people might assume are a woman's role sometimes. But For I, example? I do almost all the grocery shopping, a good deal of the cooking. We get a lot of help from Karen's parents. Dads are missing out if they're not having these experiences. I think we should 
re-examine what it means to be a man. What would you say to somebody who went on your wife's page and said, you're not a good mom? I would invite them to come and see how Watch hard out. she works and how much she does. Hello. This guy's Karen living says, the fucking the dream. The trend should not be Mommy Wars Part 2. Women should have that freedom to choose. The problem is those who say that, you know, you shouldn't have a choice, that all women should do this, like this is the ideal situation for everyone. Do you consider yourself a good mom? Oh my God, that's a great question. And I think my initial response, I think says so much because my honest initial response was like, I'm okay. <laughs> but I think if you ask my kids, I think they would say I'm a really good mom. So what did you do today? When it comes to feeling like my kids, oh, wow. that they feel supported, that they're happy, they're healthy, um, you know, looking at, I revise my answer. I say, I think I'm a really great mom. That message of choice and yeah. tolerance you is one that? Ivy agrees with. What would you say to women who would say to you, I love my job, I love my career, and I don't love my kids any less than you do? I would say I believe you. And so I wouldn't even challenge that. I know that moms love their children. I, I think a lot of people assume that I think I'm, I'm telling everybody you need to do this and you need to live like me, and I'm not. But I do think a lot of women should consider it. That's kind of my message is that you can want this. Yeah, no, she's, I, I, I believe it. I believe it. I don't think she's like Abigail Shapiro. Through the Erie, Pennsylvania, like, post Whistle office. Blowers, right, we're going to get back to the fucking beauties of, um. Damn, this guy's good.